welcome everybody. Uh, as always, we are doing the Dada lecture series here today. Um, uh, I want to thank you all for for logging in and taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for today's speaker. Uh, I also want to give uh, thanks to our speakers committee uh, who has allowed the funding to bring in such wonderful artists and uh, people from the arts and design community to come and talk with us on Fridays. Uh, without their help, we wouldn't be able to have uh, the wonderful breadth of speakers that we've been able to have over the past year. Um, today, we have Elizabeth McFalls. Uh, Elizabeth McFalls is a professor of art and the Department of Arts Art Foundation Coordinator at Columbus State University. She received her MFA in printmaking from Cranbrook Academy of Art and earned her BFA from Columbus College of Art in, uh, and Design in Ohio. Libby's love of storytelling began in childhood. Having been raised in East Tennessee, she attended the National Storytelling Festival on numerous occasions. She recalls summers spent developing a love and appreciation for oral storytelling. She and her sisters were fortunate enough to spend a great deal of time with extended family that spread five living generations. While her work does not make direct reference to her family history, she creates nonlinear visual narratives that examine issues of loss and family. Her work explores moments that blur the line between fact and fiction, life and death, humor and sorrow, moments that demonstrate the contradiction and complexity of life. Libby's work has been shown in numerous exhibitions nationally and internationally, including the Athica Athens Institute, South Bay Contemporary in Los Angeles, uh, Sola Gallery, Kai Lin Art Gallery, the Cade Center, for the Arts and the Gallery One in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, additionally, she serves as the VP of Communications for Foundations of Art, uh, Theory and Education, also known as FATE. So if you guys will give a wonderful welcoming round of applause to Libby McFalls. All right, thank you. Hi, hi everyone, Emily, I appreciate that. I'm gonna go ahead and screen share and try and multitask um, here while I'm talking. Um, so as Emily mentioned, I am a professor of art. Oh dear. I am so sorry, Emily, I had this on presentation and now it's- Got it. Didn't. Thank you, Tom. Okay, my apologies. Oh boy. All right. Now I'm going to try this again. Oh, so this is my personal studio. Okay. With wow, you wouldn't know that I've done this at least 10 times since, um, <laughs> since the start COVID. Of COVID. Yeah, and now, now that overconfidence, it just, it just did me in. Okay. All right. So now we should be good to go in just one second. All right. So now let me go ahead. That's what happens when I screen share and try and talk at the same time. And I just want to give a quick reminder uh, to anybody, if you have any questions as Libby is giving her presentation, feel free to put it in the chat and we will get those at the end of today's lecture. Okay. All right. So now we'll just pretend like I hadn't screwed up. Okay. So um, in any case, so um, thank you, Emily, and for um, the, the faculty and staff at Webster for having me today. And for all of you folks for taking time out of your afternoon um, to sit in. And um, I am a professor of art and the Art Foundation Coordinator at Columbus State University. And it's in the Southwest Georgia area, right on the, the banks of the Chattahoochee. So um, you're gonna get to see a little peek of my studio space and it's uh, a quite lovely place uh, and community to live. And there's a lot of support in the arts here. But as I was preparing for today, I was thinking about um, things that I, I kind of most enjoyed when I was in undergraduate school and what I found to be really the most beneficial, not only at that time, but also uh, for my students when we bring in artists. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about today about kind of shifting gears throughout an artistic career, because it's something that all of us have to do and you all certainly will have to do as you start out in your young careers. And um, I also always enjoy seeing people's studio spaces. And so, um, last fall, a couple of months ago, I gave a talk at um, the Gatsta Museum of Art and the Art Center in Tallahassee, Florida, along with the solo exhibit I had. 
And I thought that I would include this short video just for you all to take a quick peek since you're not able to come in person. I think that it's nice to see how studio artists lay out their space and how that can sometimes influence um, how they make and really what they make. So it's a pretty quick video. It's about five or six minutes and then we'll jump into um, the making process and my work. So this is my personal studio, which again is located um, on the bank of the Chattahoochee River in Columbus, Georgia. I use two spaces when producing my work. One is the printmaking facility located within the Corn Center um, Visual Arts building, our studio building, and the other is here in the depot. On the wall, you'll see works that are currently in progress. They are a combination of drawing, prints, collage. All of the prints that I actually pull are, are pulled next door using a press with a variety of means, either a litho, possibly relief. You'll also see some monoprint techniques. Um, the next wall in my studio is basically remnants of those prints. So as I produce work, I do apply them to something which is called Duramount, which allows any kind of print or piece of paper to become a double-sided sticker. It is an archival process. And let me show you over here what that looks like. So after I pull a print, I will keep these kind of stacked up, sometimes for years, sometimes for months. You can see a variety of prints here. I also have storage. And then once I decide to use a print in a current piece, I go through the process of applying that Duramount, which you can see close up here. My apologies. I do not know why I'm having such a hard time today. But I am. pieces. Um, over here on the side of the wall, I have two pieces that have recently been completed. Again, those are also um, combination mixed media pieces of collage, drawing, and print. All of those were completed here. Um, the background is, is usually where I begin, and those are usually some type of pressure print to offer kind of a tonal background that I respond to. And then you can see some of the things like um, this noose, the rope, some of the decorative elements. Those are all parts of prints that have been cut down after they were applied to the Dura mount to offer that double stick adhesive. And then I work over a period of sometimes weeks, months, um, just depending on what my schedule is and how the work is developing. In some of these darker areas, and you'll notice this within the exhibit as well, this is actually me going back in, oftentimes with graphite, sometimes with charcoal, and sometimes with colored pencils, and working back in to the piece. I do that sometimes uh, for formal reasons, sometimes to add depth, uh, sometimes um, it also enforces maybe the concepts or ideas that I have within the piece. And you can see that I, I work back and forth. The drawing does not always come last. And in fact, very often it will come second. So in this piece, I would have completed the background print, added some graphite, where I wanted areas to get darker, and then continue to cut and collage from the stack of prints that I showed you a moment ago. I do have a small press in my studio. Oftentimes it isn't large enough for the, the pieces that I'm working on, it's just ones that are in the exhibit, but it does allow for me to do some small pulls and um, either small pieces or small areas that I will ink up here in the studio, print and pull if I feel like I need something pretty immediately and I don't want to, to go to the larger lab facility 
and pull a large edition. I usually will pull just a couple of one ofs, maybe two ofs, and that will be it. And then the rest of the time, I'm really working in this area. One, um, one kind of area I've set up as an impromptu designated it as my cutting station, right? I also am a little bit messy, as you can tell. I like to, I'm one of those people that like to have everything out in front of me as I'm working so that I can find the colors I'm looking for, the shapes, the decorative elements, etc. cetera. And um, I will use this area over here, not only just to kind of spread out the pieces before I start cutting them down, but also if I need um, to apply pressure as I'm going through the process, I like to apply intermittent um, times. I like to go in and apply pressure rather than just waiting at the very end. Um, also, you can see I have a great view. This is um, the breezeway between the main art facility studio building here on campus and then the row of faculty studios, which I'm in now. And then over here, I have my drafting table, which is where I do a great deal of just my drawing and planning. Uh, so that pretty much takes us around the studio. And um, I wanted to offer this as kind of an overview of what my space looks like. So as we start talking about the pieces, um, you have an idea of, of what it looks like and, and where I am working. So thank you very much all right all right so sorry about that um i told emily it'd be no problems today uh because i'm teaching on zoom and i'm talking on zoom and yet there were a couple issues so in any case um thinking about um the, this talk and thinking about seeing the studio space and having some idea of of where i am as a maker right now versus where i've I've kind of come from. I was thinking about what some of those common threads of ideas or symbols that maybe have reappeared for quite some time, because I have been exhibiting work since the late 90s. And while I'm not going to use this, this short period as a time to talk about all of, you know, this as a retrospective, I certainly want to um, kind of identify how things have changed over the years, because many of you will be starting out in your art careers over the next few years, I'm assuming. And um, I, always, I always find it really interesting to see how my work has changed, but kind of what continuity I have between one body of work to the next. And so some of those things that you're gonna see today and that I continue to see in my work when I'm writing and reflecting on it and giving um, talks, or ideas of place and identity. Um, as Emily mentioned earlier, ideas of loss and also humor. So there's a lot of contradictions, I feel like, in my work. There's also a lot of juxtaposition of ideas, also symbols, etc. And so in 2007, um, we moved back to the South. And so I was raised in East Tennessee, but I spent nearly 16 years moving around the country, everywhere from Manhattan to Michigan, rural Maine, Ohio, um, San Francisco, and entering the South again, it was a very different place than where I grew up. Um, South Georgia is, is definitely different than East Tennessee. And I was, I was thinking about what, it, what that would mean to me as a maker and how that would change my work and how that would impact things that I have been exploring for years um, making this move. And so something that, that really struck me when I was in Michigan, and specifically I was right outside of Michigan when I was attending Cranbrook, was this the way in which that um, different set, uh, socioeconomic classes looked there versus how they looked where I had grown up or where I had gone to undergraduate school. And then I began thinking about, well, what were those similarities besides just what those differences were? How did different groups and regional locations identify themselves? If you say you're from Georgia, what does that mean to one set of people versus another? And so in that, I became very interested in this idea of the handmade sign and this, this kind of desire to communicate and it oftentimes proselytizing in some way, like inviting one to to worship. 
And that was something that happened all the time when I moved to Columbus, Georgia, was being invited to a variety of um, church invitations, which I had I had not experienced um, in such a manner at such quantity before. And so on a drive between Columbus, Georgia and um, um, Birmingham, Alabama, I came to this, I was on a state highway and it was this pitch in the road. And there was a sign that said news church. And it struck me that it was just supposed to be read two ways. And so I pulled over and there was no way as you were driving to be able to read this maker sign. I believe it was meant to say good news Baptist church, but depending on if you were driving from the east to the west or vice versa, you would either see good Baptist or news church. And there was um, a lot of humor in that for me. <laughs> and also, um, I mean, it spoke to the fact that this person, obviously I do not believe was a professional sign maker. They would have realized the error in their ability to communicate what it was they were trying to advertise. But um, there was also, um, you know, this, I, this thing that I was trying to explore too in these pieces, and you saw that installation shot just before, and pairing it with this really expensive damask wallpaper um, in a collage-like fashion. And so uh, one of the reasons that I think that this is kind of an important little grouping of work that I'm just gonna show you for a moment is because the drawing that you see here was based off of a sketch that I found um, that was probably over 20 years old by the time that I found it. Um, the drawing obviously I recreated for this piece, but when I think about where I, I started out in undergraduate school versus where I am now, when I go back and rediscover um, my sketchbooks and I go back and take a look at what it is that I was doing and making, I find that there's evidence, like there, these handmade signs have always resonated with me. And this idea of trying to communicate, and oftentimes I think there is a miscommunication when communicating with the hand, and um, I found this and I can remember this um, on the drives down on 75 and I haven't driven that road in some time, but at the, that point, Jellicoe Mountain, which is just on the line between Kentucky and Tennessee when you're heading down 75 was a pretty treacherous area. And there were times where there was virtually no shoulder on the side of the road and just this guardrail. And I can remember clearly coming around a corner and there was a hand painted sign that was yellow and black made to look as if it were an actual road cautionary sign. Um, but it said, trust Jesus. And the G had been printed instead of a J. And as you know, black does not cover with yellow very well. So there was still evidence of the G underneath the J and um, it, it really did stick with me <laughs> because not only did this person have such determination because this this really is not a very um, fantastic area of highway to drive especially if you're in your early 20s and probably driving home um, after you know studying for days on end but after you know the end of a semester but so they got out there and they they thought that this was in some way going to to maybe communicate um, some type of you know calling for Christ or something if you will and, um, but it also spoke to this, this um, idea of maybe there was obviously some type of literacy issue if they're spelling Jesus with a G um, rather than a J. And then I also was thinking about, well, who is this person and, and what is it that they're trying to, to communicate? So um, that work, I think, obviously starts to, you know, talk about some type of, of rule versus um, not rule, you know, areas. And it also begins to talk about, or does talk about rather, you know, differences and how those things begin to overlap within a community or a group of people. Um, so this handmade sign, I was thinking about the idea of the individual and the collective. And when I continued to investigate the idea of individual and collective, I became interested in things that are, are commonly shared experiences among people that don't even know each other, right? Such as loss and death um, and how something that is so personal is also shared by most, well, by everyone that, that, that will ever live. And so I decided to, to kind of play around with that in a really specific way. And I wrote a grant to work 
with the Register of Deeds Office in the state of Tennessee. And I also was awarded a residency in central Missouri, actually, um, for about a three month period one summer. And I began, um, again, working with the Register of Deeds Office. And on the marking of my father's 60th birthday, I worked with them to collect all of the information that they had from 1949 uh, to 2009. Um, within a three county list of all persons that had deceased by the name of James K. Roberts. And so what I found is that while that name was in some way important to me, obviously because it was my father's, um, I really felt that that name was kind of, could be this generic name for anyone, right? So you could run a report on any one given name and still collect information, most likely on more than just one person. And so in this time, um, I was able to collect the most um, kind of basic of information without grant getting written permission from surviving members until it had reached a certain period. So the person had to be deceased long enough to, to get further information without written permission. And so what um, I became acutely aware of is that just the data, this kind of raw data that they allowed you to see um, isn't really the truth. It may be some of the facts of someone's death, but it really isn't the truth of that person, right? So the information includes only the date in which they died, the county in which they died. That does not necessarily mean they were even a resident of the state. They just happened to die in that county. Their age, their gender, their race, their race could only be white or non-white. There are no other descriptors. And that was in 2009. <laughs> like <laughs> that kind of blew my mind that in 2009, I understood at some point, maybe that was the only way um, that they would um, collect information on race. But in 2009, I was, I was rather startled. Also marital status is evidently incredibly important. Even, even so, if um, there, were, there were stillborns that were in this list and they would still write not married, <laughs> which anyhow, that's another point, but you, you find out some weird things when you're kind of digging through records. And then the number, if you're wondering, that would indicate the person's kind of order of death in the state. So on the 6th of January in 1988, he was the 1,564th person to die, which is actually a thought, kind of a high number for the sixth day of the year. But in any case, um, so in this process, I was also going, and when it was available, I was actually going and documenting through um, photograph the final resting places of these individuals. I was unable to find that information. I'm not even sure that, that um, some of that information was even collected by the state, but when it was, I did. And I was able to then kind of compare that with those kind of sentiments, right, or images that are put on headstones, like beloved mother, um, I don't know, asleep, this one says asleep in Christ, etc. You know, so kind of beginning to pair the personal with um, the not personal, right? So as the state is recording you, and how your family is remembering you. And along with that, I was also interested in thinking about, well, what is the personal and, and what is the cause of death? And, and that wasn't necessarily a major interest of mine, but I was interested in kind of bringing some humor to the pieces and also to continue to talk about and this idea of place. And in this case, I was writing out the oral stories as I had recorded them from my father. And so this series of work, I think was approximately three years in the making and I, I ended up with a total of 27 pieces. And if you're familiar with the film, um, Big Fish, it's, it's one of my favorites. And, um, and it really does articulate the problems with discerning what is truth from, <laughs> from fiction, right? And then how often those two things are so deeply intertwined that it doesn't really matter which is the truth and which, and which isn't. And um, so these were all stories that I had I'd grown up hearing over my life, over kitchen tables and 
and coffee, um, stories that quite frankly, you would think that most people would have met their demise. Um, stories of taking um, automatic weapons out and, and mowing down <laughs> trees and um, um, crashing small aircrafts and, and all of these things my father walked away from. Um, and some unharmed and, and some harmed, but in any case, so often um, when these works were, were still being shown, they're not, I'm not really showing these anymore, but uh, one comment that people would normally get and they, or question they would have when they would come up to me was that they honestly didn't believe any of them because they just seemed so outlandish and um, their, their truth as my father tells it, that's all I can say. <laughs> um, but I also think that people can identify not only um, necessarily with this idea of storytelling and, and, and trying to always figure out kind of what is the reasons um, for someone losing someone in some cases at a young age and, and some not, but being able to identify with this, this idea of the person who is, who is kind of spinning those stories and how much I think that, that at least for me, I often enjoy them, whether or not I'll ever know that they're true. I, I, I choose to believe they are true. Um, along with that kind of um, idea of, of kind of pushing and pulling and, and thinking about um, the individual in place, there is definitely this, um, the evidence of, of the dialect and also regionalism and the way that, that words are used, terms, um, that you can almost like hear that speech and you can almost begin to, to identify them with kind of East Tennessee and Appalachia. Um, also, you'll notice that not only in these drawings, but in uh, the collage pieces I showed just a moment ago, I'm often really playing around with this extraction and having these strong contrasts between um, the actual object, in these cases, headstones, and then like the lack of background and skewing and purposefully changing perspective so that things quite frankly don't settle correctly. I think much in the same way that, you know, oral storytelling doesn't necessarily, you know, all, all jive up all the time, so to speak. So in any case, the work that I was making at that time um, and, and that those pieces wrapped up late 2011, maybe, um, became kind of unsustainable for a, a number of reasons. I mean, they, the graphite drawings were getting up in the neighborhood of 40 by 60 inches. They were taking a number of hours. I was pulling a lot of really highly rendered um, lithographs. And I quite frankly, um, couldn't keep up with my time, time constraints. And so, I mentioned at the beginning that I was going to talk about um, how changes and life changes and circumstances will most certainly adjust your making process and what you were interested in. And parenthood is not the last thing that will, will throw me for a loop, but it's certainly been kind of uh, the biggest change in our house um, in, in recent history. And so um, the, the reason those pieces became unsustainable is that not only had I kind of exhausted my interest in them, which I'm sure by now you all have reached points in some of your works where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of tired of making this. But also um, I just didn't quite frankly have that type of physical time. And, um, and I, I felt as if I wasn't accomplishing much. I mean, I'm gonna be frank with you all because I think that that's important, um, especially for young artists to hear is that I felt like walking into the studio was a bit defeating at times because I knew that I needed, let's say 70 hours to complete a stone drawing that didn't include printing. Um, and if you don't have a lot of time, you don't get a lot of work done. <laughs> so, um, so, so now I'm going to get to some of my more recent work and talk about how I made that leap and kind of what, what moved me in that direction. But that's really where I was. And um, in addition to the lack of time, over a period of three years, my husband and I, we had three children and we have two surviving children. So we did lose um, one, of our, one of our children um, in infancy. And um, beyond the fact that we didn't have much time, so to speak, I also quite frankly, didn't feel like making. It was um, a difficult adjustment to get through. 
And the irony was not lost on me that I had made work about loss my entire life. And, um, and then we were experiencing it. And so thinking about um, loss, I also didn't want to grieve, but I also was looking for um, a, a way to move forward, right? So how, how am I, who am I after this loss? Who is our family? What are we? And who am I as a maker? Because my experience, and, and maybe others have different experiences, but anytime that you have a significant life change in my, in my, in my experience, again, um, it, it changes um, how I approach just making, the way that I'm thinking, the way that I'm interacting with materials, um, and really just the desire to create. And so I started to consider um, evidence. So when you, when you lose someone and someone who had such a profound impact on you as a family unit, but had no <laughs> impact on any of our friends or any of our colleagues um, because nobody was able to meet him, what evidence do you have that you carry forward? And so while these pieces are very specifically about the loss of our second child, I think that the, the idea of how we carry forward our memories and the stories of people and the impact um, of our lives is, is a similar struggle, no matter where you experience that loss. And so something that was happening here is that as I was working through those pieces and they are, you can see they're, they're significantly smaller. These are 11 by 17 inches and I was, had been working 60 by 40. Um, I was also realizing that I didn't have to. And again, these are all expectations that I had put upon myself because I'm an adult and I'm the one making the art, but I still was working under a set of expectations that I had outlined for myself is that I was, I was allowing myself to, to kind of play and to have fun. I know that sounds weird considering the subject matter, but most of you have had experiences when you're working, you're not thinking about whatever your ideas are. You're just thinking about pencils on paper and, and it was quite fun. And so um, through that, and I'm not gonna show you kind of pieces that were made in that kind of three year period, but I realized that I was ready to fully engage in the studio again. I mean, obviously our children were older, they, they didn't require as much attention. But I was really ready to kind of take a deep dive into my work and commit myself um, full force again. And so in 2018, I was able to take part in a one year resident residency and artist residency in motherhood. And it is uh, funded and supported through the Sustainable Arts Foundation and was set up by the artist um, Linka Clayton. And it was a really great experience because it allowed me to stay in my physical studio space. For those of you um, who aren't aware of this, at some point you might wanna look into it depending on, on what comes down the road for some of you. Um, they do provide funding to pay for studio spaces. I fortunately have a studio space through my university, but I, they were able to assist us with additional funds for childcare. And so um, that was a kind of a game changer. And so as I began working, I was taking what I had began um, in those pieces, those early pieces that I showed you. Um, and I was using that as a starting point because I had been working in kind of two different kind of siloed studio practices for a number of years. I had my print work and then I had my drawing work. And depending on what I thought was appropriate at that moment, that is the medium that I was choosing. And so here I was beginning to basically screen print or pull relief prints of images that I thought were symbolic of what I was experiencing at that point. And so you see here like baby bibs, and you'll see, I don't know, um, baby um, onesies, rattles, et cetera, will show up. But I was basically looking and finding these images and then I would burn them into a screen and I would do a large um, run of them and then I would cut them up. And many of them were used and some were not. 
You also see evidence in like here, um, where I'm moving my cursor, you can see some of the drawings that I continued to make after that evidence series that I just quite frankly, either didn't like or didn't want anymore. Um, and I, I was repurposing and using those. Um, and as I was moving through, I, I began to consider ways, because it was very tightly in the beginning, the concepts were kind of wound around this idea of loss and the idea of loss of the individual, because while I've been focusing on loss as far as um, losing a loved one, there's also this loss as an individual when you decide to have children um, and they all of a sudden are taking up, they are the priority, they, they, are, they are what you're building your world around. And so I thought, well, I'm not 100% interested in making work about that all the time. And so I began to look back at older pieces. And so this is an example you can see in the coal miner of um, a print. It was it is a lithograph that I had cut and collaged into this piece because I was very interested, even with the mono prints and the drawing in the background. So this is graphite in the background and creating these really rich dark values to be in contrast to things that are seemingly either happy or colorful in nature. Um, continuing to, to think about some of the ideas that I had brought up when I was talking about the handmade signs. I felt like um, the representation of the coal miners were in a way akin to that. They were just a different body of work. Um, as I continued working, I was moving away from some of these kind of stereotypical symbols, right? Of toddlerhood, of baby. So you see um, the little footsies, the little bitty um, saddle shoes there and starting to work a little bit more intuitively because that's what I was becoming most interested in in my actual studio practice. Like when I was in the making, I actually had you know hours in which that I'm just in the lab, just pulling prints with, um, my, my student interns and we're just pulling these large batches of prints for me to cut down at some point. And then I'm, I was always spending time just putting those together. Then I decided to kind of bring that intuitive working process into the printing as well. And that's when I got into pressure printing. And this is an example and it's an easy example to see. So I'm gonna point it out. So the excavator that is right here. Um, so that was actually at one point part of a curtain that had hung in our son's uh, bedroom. And so I was able to just literally take things out of the house. And so rather than going and looking for or drawing um, something that I felt represented, you know, reflections of our life, I was actually able to pick up residue off of the floor or things that were being thrown out or things that I just wanted to sneak out of the house and use. Um, in addition to that, you'll, you'll start to see that there's a lot of um, complexity and layering that only, I think with the colors and kind of um, the overarching ideas in the work, but also just formally with the way that these things, you can see that this is a, a detail shot of, of all of these colors are different collage pieces. They were first printed, then they were hand cut, and then they were assembled. Um, you can still see evidence in the detail um, working back into it with the graphite. But I also, as the children were kind of aging up and I'm, and I'm definitely kind of just hopping <laughs> like from missing several pieces at a time, you know, in between these, but um, collaging actual drawings that my children were completing. Um, and in this piece, this is, a, this is another one, actually the, the show I had in um, Jacksonville, Florida in January of 19. Um, you can see a nice kind of representation of that's Kelly, our son, his drawing of the Cyclops, our daughter's drawing of the cat. And then I feel like there is something that is happening not only with the meaning in the piece, but also visually the comparison between that and the aged hands that are off obviously arthritic. Um, and they have been, you know, they're no longer attached to a body, but kind of hanging on there by the rope. And so I, I think that there's something that, that can't be captured by hand uh, with an adult when we're trying to create something that, that is obviously made by a child. And so I, the kids have had a great time. They actually create pieces and then, you know, ask me to, um, you know, to include them. And sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but I will say they got a kick out of, of being in a museum and seeing their name 
on a nameplate <laughs> and made their school newspaper. Um, so in any case, so um, that kind of the, the dark tones that you saw in my previous graphite drawings and the lithographs, most of the, the collages I think that I've been showing you, they do have a lot of bright colors and, and um, lighter in tone, but there are plenty of pieces where I continue and I always have been kind of drawn to this, this kind of dark nature in work. And that isn't necessarily always because I'm trying to think of something, of, you know, considering mortality, but there's something atmospherically, I think there's something that, that happens and resonates with me as a maker. Um, being able to really kind of push those tones and being able to express, um, you know, some of my ideas a little bit better in the work. And as I've continued to evolve with this body of work, you can see that I've almost completely <laughs> left behind, I think, some of the obvious um, references um, to kind of childhood and motherhood, if you would. And I'm pulling from work where in this case, you can see an image. And if you're familiar with, with the song, Two Doors Down, then it's Dolly Parton. Um, but again, this, these are older pieces that I'm bringing in. And I just find that it's so, it's such an interesting concept to visit my previous self and think about the kind of pieces I was making about place and identity you know, 15 years ago, and then recontextualizing it in these new pieces. Um, and then I'm also um, very interested in playing around with this idea of idioms and metaphors through images. And so like birds on a wire, um, you also will see a variety of um, hints or fragments to fairy tales that show up in the works as well. Um, also sticking with that popular culture, um, you can see Roscoe P. Coltrane, um, who was incredibly popular in the 80s when I was watching TV as a kid, but I felt like not only did this older print cut up become a better version of itself, but it also really did typify this idea of miscommunication and kind of like the bumbling, fumbling idiot, so to speak, um, with this, you know, kind of cliche of the, the, the lost message in a bottle, so to speak. Um, so a, a lot of these images, and I know that I use um, a lot of symbols. Symbolism show up a lot. As Emily mentioned in the introduction, I, I really approach work um, or think about my work rather in, um, in the idea of a nonlinear narrative. And oftentimes I feel like the pieces as a whole, when I've, when I've had solo exhibits and had several pieces or you know, a dozen pieces in a room at a time, I really feel like building those, those stories and connections between the pieces work really well. But I also find that within the pieces, just recontextualizing, using the rope in one image versus another doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. Um, and so, yes, I'm, I'm aware of this idea of holding on by a, by a thread or throw me a line. Um, people have made references to, to its um, symbolism in the umbilical cord. I, that was one I had never really considered, but I suppose it was there. Um, and as the pieces have continued to, to move on, I feel like at times um, images like the rope, obviously you'll see nooses, it will reference um, death or suicide, um, but you'll also see um, that within the texts, and I think that this goes back to my printmaking background is that I've always been acutely aware of the power of a title and a piece. And that's something that was always really discussed heavily in both of my print programs is, um, what the title can bring to the work. And so I, I oftentimes am either A, trying to direct someone or almost contradict what I think some of the, the images are doing at that point. Um, but, I, but I definitely play with that as much as I do with kind of mixing the different symbols together. Um, so in any case, I thought that as I got to the most current pieces, and I do still have, I, I'm still working in the studio now, but I thought it would be fun to show you some of the pieces that were at the very tail end of that little video tour so you could see how those turned up. And um, the last three, that, and this being the second to the last, is, is really 
I think giving an example of how this kind of layering and duality in the work is coming together and has evolved. I think that it's easy to kind of categorize thing as, things as only being a response to that change in life, right? That change to becoming a parent. I believe that the pieces um, that I'm making now really do reflect this kind of breakdown of siloing of parts of our lives. And I think that that's something that, um, that's, that I had been aware of more when I was starting out in my art career is really embracing all of the different aspects of myself. Um, I think the, the pandemic has, has taught many, us, many of us that you know our home life, our work life, our art life, they are all intertwined. <laughs> I mean, you're working from your couch, you're enjoying you know, your home life on your couch. Um, and so these pieces really do become reflections, I think, of, of daily um, conversations, connections, communication, the, the blurring of lines and places, um, and really do become more of a conversation and questioning what those different juxtapositions are. Um, within any of our daily lives. So, and obviously specifically mine, but um, in any case, so that is um, the last piece. And I think that I've hopefully timed it that we have just about 10 or 15 minutes for questions and answers. So thank you again, Emily, and thank you all for today. Thank you, Libby. Uh, all right, so, uh, okay, if anybody has a, question if they want to put it in the chat we already have one that was asked at the very beginning which is do you attach drawings onto the Durham mount as well um yes i i do i attach um yes drawings um prints whatever it is that i'm cutting up in my studio i attach it to Durham mount i so, love Durham mount okay. <laughs> It is, it is applied to all two-dimensional surfaces. Got it. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, so let's open it up to questions. Uh, if you guys want to put them in the chat or you can unmute and just ask it uh, uh, via, via real life, that is also allowed. Um, I'm curious, uh, just let's see, how do you attach them? Emily has that. Okay. I think you touched um, it briefly in the video, yeah. but yeah, when when I was introduced to Durham Mount, it kind of blew my mind. <laughs> um, because if, if you've been trained in printmaking and using things like you know different pastes and chincolle, I'm like, oh my gosh, where was this when I was learning? In any case, um, so how I attach them is that I I simply just with actual just kind of pressure using. Um, I just use like a little squeegee, like a very hard plastic squeegee just to attach it in my studio itself. And then once an image is completed, so that basically will apply enough pressure that it will, it'll hold on right during the making. Um, but then when I'm completely done with the entire piece, I have no more additions, no more drawings. I will take it over to the studio and use one of our large etching presses and I crank that baby down as far as I can and I run it through the press. Oh, look, you all have some Duramount. There you go. Yeah, we have a ton of Duramount in the free art class. Yeah. All right, shout out to Tate, who's going to be uh, <laughs> teaching the free art class. So welcome welcome to Duramount if, if you're going to be taking that class with Tate. Uh, yeah, Tate, you're, you're, you know, printmaker extraordinaire. Do you have any questions for Libby? Also went to UGA, by the way. Oh, well, did you study? Uh, who did you study under? I he, said, he said John Swindler taught him about Duramount. Oh my gosh, small world. I, I know, yeah. I don't have any questions, but I, I totally thought that John might have been uh, your introduction to Duramount. Maybe you were his. No. Yeah. So as the story goes, um, he he came in right at the time before I started collaging again. And I brought him in for a workshop with my students. And I think I left with more excitement than my students did. He, <laughs> and, uh, he and my husband are actually collaborators now. So um, they do the kind of uh, 
you know, 3D, 2D print work. So yeah, we're pretty, we're, we love John Swindler in our house. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, all right, so we got a question from Tyler Stallings. Uh, Cranbrook was the hub for linguistic deconstruction with Catherine McCoy and Ed Fella. Was this an influence in your work? Uh, I would be lying if I said they didn't influence my work, um, but I, I don't know that I, I think about it as much anymore. Definitely when I was in graduate school, <laughs> um, decon deconstructing um, meaning and the usefulness of language, I think was something that was talked about quite often. Um, yeah, Cranbrook, I think more than anything, those two years, drastically changed the way that that I thought about making work but also really have influenced me as a teacher <laughs> as an educator um yeah I, I students have told me they have conversations in my class that they don't have in other classes but um yeah so I didn't I didn't I, I don't know that I think about it as much anymore but back when I was in school yes I mean, I think that's always a good compliment if a student says that. I don't know. It depends. Because <laughs> um, I'm also a storyteller. So my students know enough that it's easy to get me off track. So in any uh, case. I know I'm I'm just curious. Uh, so the the work that you did with the gravestones that were with your father's name, um, was that a direct reaction to, to a loss or is that more so a preemptive um, investigation? Preemptive. I mean, my father actually hates those pieces <laughs> because um, I'm very grateful that he is alive and well, but I felt like um, focusing on his name was something that I could kind of Again, he was a big story. He is a big storyteller. He always reminds me, you can't talk about me in the past. Um, he is a big storyteller. And um, I was really using it as a vehicle to investigate this idea of, of the individual versus a collective and those, those two experiences coming together. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions, you guys? We've got a finite amount of time with Libby. So by all means, ask her all technical questions. I know you printmakers always have technical questions. Um, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm kind of astounded because I don't, I feel like the work that I saw of yours, at least back when I was at Columbus State was always the coal miner pieces. I don't know if I actually saw many of the, um, the stone pieces while you were working on them. I guess because you must have been working on them when I was there. Probably. And uh, the nice thing about working with print is that you're out in the open, right? And so people see what you're doing. And then what I have found, and this might just be my personal preference, is that when I'm in the studio, I like to close the door. <laughs> like if I'm in like my physical studio, not the print studio, I like to close the door and work. And I'm embarrassed to say, Emily, I don't remember what year you graduated. I graduated in 2011. Okay. Oh, oh, so you were there when I was doing those. Um, I started CSU in 2007 and left in 2011. So y'all had just. Yeah. Yeah. We all it. arrived at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was, I was making, I was making more drawings than I was in those prints at that point. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. We've got, uh, do you ever work in commercial editorial space uh, versus making on your own? commercial editorial space. Um, I don't think so. I'm not exactly sure what, what commercial editorial space is. I'm, I'm thinking uh, from like a, uh, a commercial design standpoint. I yeah. Think most oh, well, right. after I graduated um, from Cranbrook, um, I actually worked at two professional print studios. I also, when I, in between undergrad and grad, I was working with um, a mesotent printer in Brooklyn um, as a studio assistant, but I did work in um, a graphic design and um, an off print, off press printing press, a Heidelberg we were using to do commercial print jobs, but I haven't done that in quite some time. 
So <laughs> I, I think I think I, I stopped that in 2002 or 2013. Yeah. 2003 something like that it's, I think it's a question that we always like to ask we like to find out about the 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 interim jobs that everybody always gets to have like yeah. right out of the gate oh yeah um, there were yeah I I was uh teaching at a community college and I worked at a company for a while that um printed did the printing on coca-cola machines so the vending machines we did industrial printing for that um, and then I also ended up moving into doing pre-flight graphic design and offset front press while teaching at a community college for several years. Nice. So, yeah. um, so speaking of, we, uh, you briefly touched on, you know, how life changes sort of impact, uh, the working process. Um, I suppose I, I just am curious what advice you would give, um, let's say like the students that are in my lecture course that are primarily like juniors and seniors um, who potentially, you know, are going to be entering into uh, the, the real world outside of academia in terms of, uh, in terms of like how to manage those life changes or how to channel that back into a studio practice even when it's really hard. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's just a good question. <laughs> it's important because um, I personally did not think that, you know, uh, the first few years after getting my degree were the easiest. Um, but I also recognize the fact that I was able to be employed and have these tangible kind of connections to, to making, right? So <clears throat> when I was I was obviously teaching at a community college, as I mentioned, and then also working pre-flight in those print shops. I was also in the evening working at home. And that's really when I started drawing because I did not have access to etching presses, litho presses. And um, that's something I neglected to mention in the talk is that my drawing practice was birthed out of not having access to facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and there were times when I was living in a very, very, very tiny apartment. I don't remember what the square footage was, but my coffee table doubled as my drawing table. And there's, while it could have been hard at that time, it was, it's also kind of fun looking back and, and remembering what it is that I did and then how the lack of resources and kind of juggling so much really did impact. I don't know if I would have ever started drawing. I mean, to be quite frank with you, I, I don't know that I would have because I was not a fan of drawing in college. <laughs> uh, the exact same yeah. thing happened yeah. to me when I left grad school and I was in Brooklyn. So yeah, I think yeah. I think the love of drawing comes later out of necessity. Yeah. It wasn't initially there for some people. Yeah. Um, excellent. So work with what you have, I suppose, is the- Yeah, yeah. Be flexible and um, whatever it, like whenever you feel like you can't work. I mean, sometimes you do need a break, but I, when I talked about putting those kind of parameters on myself and what I considered what was quote unquote acceptable for me to make, I had to have a hard conversation with myself and just say, okay, I don't have 70 hours to complete a drawing. I've got 45 minutes this week. I've got three hours next week. So that's, I really think the reason I'm collaging these days. So I don't, I don't know what my practice is going to look like in five years from now. I would be surprised if I'm still collaging. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But you love Duramount so much. Okay. I, so we've I got love I do love Durham out. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, we've got one or one or two more if you're willing to to answer yeah. one or two more. Okay. So I, I think this one's attached to what we were just talking about. Um, what ways do you move out of art blocks or feeling worn out with certain art processes? How do I get out of that? Yeah. Boy. Um, so. Hmm. So for me, it has always been that I, I just go back and look at sketchbooks and start to kind of think about things that I was drawing or, or what it was that I was drawing and see if that's something I can grab onto. Also for me, thinking about stories, things that I'm reading, reading is, is big 
for me. I, I read about four or five books a month. <laughs> and, um, and so those are always kind of, I, I don't know, there, even if it's not necessarily a topic that I would ever make work about, there's usually a line or two that gets me to think about circumstances and making in a different way, even if it's, you know, fiction and completely unrelated to art. Uh, I feel that it's all incorporated. And um, when I'm in doubt and I don't know what to do, I really, I just draw. I just start drawing. And, um, and for those of you who are, are printmakers, I don't know how many of those of you are here, um, I also am a huge fan of just putting some stuff on a press and having some fun through pressure printing or collage, like, um, you know, different type of monoprint techniques. Um, and then seeing where that goes. Nice. And then lastly, we've got uh, Lauren says, you've mentioned at the beginning how a studio space can really impact an individual's work. What are some characteristics of a studio that are very important to you? Well, what I've learned that's really important to me is having light. <laughs> I've worked in a lot of really dark studios and, um, and I'm not going to knock dark studios. If that's all that you've got, that's what you got to work with. Mm -hmm. um, but I have found that when the space has some natural light, I want to be in that space. And to me, that's really important just as a way to, to it not feel as if it's a chore to go in. Other things that are important to me as a maker is that I like dividing space. And even if that just means it's two tables in a room, I know that I have one table is for this job, another table is for a different job. And um, for me, that becomes important. So just kind of separating kind of designating what my areas are for, and then also just having some natural light. All right. Light and zones. Yeah, light and zones. Like, I, resp I, I respond to that very well. I currently have a studio that finally has light after living from a making standpoint in uh, dingy basements, finally, so. Yeah, I didn't get a studio with light until like 2015. <laughs> You have a really great studio with light. You've got that like, massive. I, I do. Light. I got a great studio now, but I, I put in the time with some crappy studios. I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> uh, well, I I think that's about all the time we have for today. Uh, I want to thank you again so much for coming and talking with our students, and uh, yeah, for just being open and sharing with us today. Um, and hopefully at some point I will make it back down to Columbus in the future and, and we can all we can all reconnect soon. Yes, post pandemic, right? Yes. Fingers, fingers crossed. All Listen. right. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciated it. I'm sorry for the rough start. And um, I hope that you all have a great weekend and everybody stays healthy. Yeah, you too. Okay. Thanks. All right. Bye. -bye. Bye.